the main goal here, or what we're mainly trying to understand here, is how nervous tissue makes decisions, or how neurons make decisions. With some pretty basic thoughts, it's really easy to understand how you make decisions, how your decisions involve pros and cons, and those pros and cons can be of various strength. And these decisions can be everything from like our metaphor today, do I take an umbrella, to is that a T or an I, is that the word the or them, is my car moving to the left and so I need to steer a little bit to the right to stay in my lane? Is that something off to the side of the road that I need to respond to? These are all small little decisions that guide our overall consciousness. But if we go back to the neural level, basically what neurons do is they gather a lot of input, pro and con input, and they come to a yes or no decision. Another really critical subtext is we're starting to begin to look at electrolytes, really important electrolytes like sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride. Now we kind of touched on this back when we talked about chemistry, and we talked about ion bonds, and we talked about how sodium and chloride will disassociate in water, and they'll kind of relate to each other, and they have a charge reaction and things like that. And so we're going to build on that now. It's going to be really an important build because sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride are going to come up continuously throughout AMP1 and AMP2. It's one of the last things we talk about in AMP2 when we talk about the urinary system and electrolyte balance. We're going to talk about when we talk about how muscles contract. We're going to talk about with the endocrine system, because calcium has a role there. We're going to talk about with the reproductive system, because calcium has a role there. We're going to talk about it and how it sets the heart rate, because sodium and potassium set the heart rate. We're going to talk about how muscle contracts in the heart as well. So anyway, these ions, these electrolytes, are going to keep popping up over and over again. And one of the biggest things I want you to take away from AMP1 and AMP2 is respect for these electrolytes and this electrolyte balance. One of the hard parts of developing that respect is the body is so good at regulating these ions, and they so rarely get off. But if they do get off, if there's an imbalance in these ions, it's almost always immediately tragic. Some examples that you can think about are Terry Schiavo, due to diet problems, had an imbalance of potassium that shut down her heart and led to a coma. Or another really kind of unfortunately infamous event happened, I think, last February with the water drinking contest. If you drink too much water, it causes water toxicity, which basically is relating to these electrolytes because you're diluting out these electrolytes. And as you'll see here today, that's going to affect how neurons function. So beginning again at the bottom of the sheet with the model cell, this is essentially a model cell. It's got a few things added to it now because we're in our third run through. But at its heart, you have a sodium potassium ATPase and you have a plasma membrane and you're distributing sodium and potassium due to that sodium potassium ATPase. And again, this model cell will represent in any cell in the body. And this certainly is going to represent this soma right here. This is the main thing that we're going to focus on right here, is we can pretend that this sodium potassium ATPase down here is actually in the membrane of this neuron. So let's talk about this sodium potassium ATPase. First of all, ATPase means it's an enzyme that breaks down ATP. And what it does, it moves sodium and potassium across the plasma membrane. Specifically what it does is it pumps sodium. So a lot of the time, this is called a sodium potassium pump. And again, specifically what it does is it pumps three sodiums out and two potassiums into the cell. It's going to set up two gradients. The first one hopefully is fairly clear that if you're pumping sodium out, you're going to end up with more sodium on the outside than on the inside. And if you're pumping potassium in, you're going to end up with more potassium on the inside than on the outside. The other thing might be a little bit harder to see is it's going to set up an electrical gradient you're pumping three sodium ions out or three positive charges out and you're only pumping two potassium ions in or two positive charges in. So essentially what you're doing is you're pumping positive charge outside the cell. Now the first guy that talked about this, he had a choice. He could talk about the outside of the cell is positive relative to the inside or same thing, he could say the inside is negative relative to the outside. And he chose to speak about the inside of the cell as being negative relative to the outside. 70 millivolts. Millivolts or volts is the unit of charge. We can also speak of this as the voltage of the membrane, which is abbreviated as Vm. So Vm equals minus 70 millivolts or MV. So now the sodium potassium ATPase has set up these initial conditions and hopefully we can see that ions want to move, but let's get more specific about why do ions want to move and that's number two here. Again, it comes down to those two gradients set up by the sodium potassium ATPase, the chemical gradient and the electrical gradient. The chemical gradient is simply the sodium is stacked up on the outside of the cell, and it would like to move away from itself. 
One sodium ion would like to move away from other sodium ions just by diffusion. Potassium has the same situation. It's stacked up on the inside of the cell. Each potassium ion would like to get away from other potassium ions by diffusion, so it wants to move outside the cell. There's also an electrical gradient set up by that minus 70 millivolts inside the cell. And sodium and potassium are going to react differently to that minus 70 millivolts. Because sodium is on the outside, it's positively charged, and it wants to come into that negative charge because opposites attract. So the positive sodium wants to be next to that negative charge. So sodium is going to be drawn into the cell by the electrical gradient. Potassium is already next to that minus 70, so it really doesn't want to leave if you look at just the electrical gradient. Potassium does not want to go against the electrical gradient. Now if you put the chemical gradient and the electrical gradient together, the chemical gradient is going to be much stronger than the electrical gradient. And so potassium is going to leave. Another way we can think about that is if you could open up a channel that would let both sodium and potassium through, what would happen? Now this is a rare situation because most of the time an ion channel is just going to let one type of ion through. So there's a sodium channel that lets sodium through, or there's a potassium channel that just lets potassium through. There is one specific case that is going to come up when we talk about muscle physiology, where a channel will let both sodium and potassium flow through the same opening. And in this case, sodium is going to come in faster than potassium leaves. And that's because sodium, again, is being drawn in by both the chemical gradient and the electrical gradient, while potassium wants to leave by the chemical gradient, but it wants to stay by the electrical gradient. So hopefully it's clear that ions want to move. The next question then, question number three becomes, how do those ions move? Ion channels. And there's four main types of ion channels. There's voltage-gated channels that are going to respond to the voltage of the membrane, or VM. There's ligand-gated channels that are going to open when the chemical binds to them. There's mechano-gated channels, and they're responding to force. And the main example here is going to be a sound wave. And then there's leak channels that are really, really small, but they're open all the time. So I'm focusing in a little bit more, and I'm going to start on the voltage-gated channels so that we can describe why those open and close. We're going to start with something called a gate, and obviously these are real simple cartoons. And right here is our gate, and that's going to keep the channel closed. On the gates are positive charges in the case of the voltage-gated channel. These positive charges are going to respond to the voltage of the membrane inside the cell. If the inside of the cell is like minus 70 millivolts, those positive charges are going to be attracted to the negativity inside the cell. And so this gate is going to stay slid down. If we change the voltage towards positive, now here I've got it as plus 30 millivolts. But in the case of a sodium channel, it might be just a small shift in voltage up to minus 55 millivolts. But if you move a little bit positive, then those positive charges say, I'm not really attracted to the inside of the cell as much now, so I'm going to slide out. And when it slides out, the channel is open and an ion can pass through. Ligand-gated channels are considerably simpler. Basically, a ligand is a chemical that when it binds to the gates, it opens the gates. If there's no chemical bound, the gate stays closed and no ions can pass. Just let sodium flow in all the time and potassium flow all the time. To be honest, for the most part, we're really only concerned with voltage-gated and ligand-gated channels at this time. And you're going to see those popping up. You'll see them on this figure here. The voltage-gated channels are drawn here. Ligand-gated channels are drawn over here.